Please turn this morning to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. This morning, in our study of this book, we come to the 25th verse. It says this, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy, your love that has made us your children. Lord, on behalf of all those this morning who know You in this place, who've been saved by Your grace through faith in Your Son, thank You, Lord, for saving us. Thank You that You've given us Your Word and that You've given us Your Holy Spirit so that, Lord, truly You are our Teacher. We ask You this morning to take Your living Word in hand and deal with our lives. We do ask again, dear Father, on behalf of the lost in this place this morning. Lord, by Your grace, because of Your grace, may You open their hearts and minds to see the truth as it is in Jesus. May they hear the Son of God this morning through Your Word and be raised from the dead spiritually. Lord, we thank You that Your Word will accomplish everything that You've sent it forth to accomplish this morning, bringing belief and confirming people in unbelief and building Your people up through correction and instruction. We love You, Lord, and thank You for all of this. In Jesus' name, Amen. When we come to the 25th verse, actually down through verse 32 of chapter 4, we come to the specific application of the truth that he's been teaching us about conversion. He's taught us in verses 17 through 24 that a Christian is someone who lives a different life because they've been made a different person. That there was a day, the day when we were converted, that we heard the truth as it is in Jesus. We not only heard about the Son of God, we heard the Son of God. Verse 21 says, If indeed you have heard Him and have been taught in Him, just as truth is in Jesus. Jesus was the subject. Jesus was the teacher. Jesus is the school in which we learn the truth. And what we heard from Him on the day that we were saved is that coming to Him is laying aside an old life. It's laying aside an old self. It's losing your life so that you can gain the life of the Son of God. And it's putting on a new self that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. When I came to Christ, praise the Lord, He not only forgave me of my sins, He not only gave me His perfect righteousness so that I could stand accepted in the presence of God, but He also changed me. He made me a new creation. And a new self that He made each one of us has been created, verse 24 says, in righteousness and holiness of the truth. He says, and put on the new self. This is what we heard from Christ and learned in Jesus, that we put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, because you are this new creation, because God has done this gracious and powerful work in you, therefore, Laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. Let him who steals, steal no longer. In other words, now here is the new life you are to live because you are a new creation. And the amazing thing to me is, the interesting thing is, where he chooses to begin making specific application of our salvation. If someone were to ask you this morning, would you tell me how to live the Christian life? Not would you tell me how to be saved. 
But rather, if they were to say to you, look, I've been saved. Would you tell me how to live the Christian life? What does the Christian life look like? If I've been made a new creation, what should my new life look like? Where would I, where should I begin? What would you say to a person? Where would you start? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? And it's an amazing thing to me that out of all the things the Apostle Paul could have written about, out of all the areas where he could have begun, the place where he begins is this, tell the truth. Speak the truth. Is that where you would begin? Is that the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about the expression of the new life that you've received in Christ? That the first thing that comes to mind is that you're to lay aside all falsehood and you're to speak the truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Why does he begin there? Why is this the first thing that he mentions? And this morning as we consider that, not only will we learn some lessons just from asking that question of the text, we'll also gain some insight into the command that we're given here to speak the truth. Why does he begin with a command to speak the truth? Let me give you the first thing. He begins here, I believe, because there's nothing more characteristic of our new self than the truth. You've been made a new creation if you're a Christian. And there's nothing more characteristic of the new self that you are than the fact that now you are oriented to the truth. What do we say when someone becomes a Christian? We say that they've seen the light. We say that they have seen the truth. And indeed they have. But the text says something more than that. The text says not only have we seen the light and seen the truth, we have been made in the likeness of God. We have a new nature that is in the likeness of God and that new nature has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. In other words, I've not simply grasped the truth in an intellectual sense. I've been given a new heart, a new self, a new nature that accords with the truth, that loves the truth, that walks in the truth. This is the new me. This is the person that I am in Christ. There's nothing more characteristic of the new self than the truth. That's why he begins there. Have you ever noticed how many times the New Testament puts the Christian in that context, describes the Christian in relationship to the truth? Let me give you some verses, and I'm going to give you several, so you just want to write down the references. You don't want to try to look them up. And I want to give you several because I want you to see how this is emphasized in your Bible. For example, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says this, "...who desires," speaking of our Lord, "...who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth." What happens when someone is saved? They've come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15 says, "...but in case I am delayed, I write, so that you may know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God." which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. What is the church of Jesus Christ? Who are we? We are the household of God, and we are the pillar and the support of the truth in this dark world. 2 Timothy 2.25, speaking about how to deal with those who are in error, it says, "...with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God..." may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. When the Lord saves someone, He grants them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. Titus 1.1 says, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness. He was an apostle on behalf of the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 2.2 2 says, speaking of false teachers, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of the truth will be maligned. Christianity is spoken of there as the way of the truth. 1 John 1.8, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. A Christian is not someone who, who simply has come to understand the truth intellectually. The truth is actually in us. 
in us. 1 John 2, four. The one who says, I've come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. 1 John 3.19 We shall know by this that we are of the truth and shall assure our heart before Him. 2 John 1.1 1, 1, The elder to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, for the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. How does he describe Christians there? People who not only know the truth, but they love the truth, and there is the truth which abides in them and will be with them forever. 3 John 1.8, Therefore we ought to support such men that we may be fellow workers with the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2.10, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. What is it when you're saved? You receive the love of the truth. Second Thessalonians 2.13 But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. And if you talk about the love of God that has been shed abroad in our hearts, the love of God and what characterizes it, 1 Corinthians 13.6 says this, Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. If you know, if you really know the love of God, if the love of God is really operating in your life, you don't rejoice in unrighteousness, you rejoice in truth, in the truth. Romans 1.18 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. What characterizes a lost and dying world? That world suppresses the truth. What is the essence of unrighteousness? It is a suppression of the truth. When someone gets saved, when they come to know the Lord Jesus, far from wanting the truth suppressed, they want the truth unveiled. They want the truth revealed. Why? Because in your new self, you find yourself in accord with the truth. The truth rings true in your heart. You love the truth. You've come to know the One who is the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ. You walk in the truth as a pattern of life. Your whole new nature has been made in the likeness of God and created in holiness and righteousness of the truth. Now, let's just say this. Saved people will be characterized by telling the truth. If someone is a liar, if someone finds it their life pattern to be deceptive, to be untruthful, they are giving evidence that they have never been saved, that they don't have that new nature that accords with the truth. That's why Revelation 21.8 says this, "...but for the cowardly and unbelieving..." and abominable, and murderers, and immoral persons, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars. Their part will be the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Describing those who will know the lake of fire one day, he describes them as cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. People who habitually lie are people who have not been saved. So why does he begin here? He's going to describe how to live the Christian life. Why does he begin with telling the truth? Because nothing is more characteristic of a new creation in the Lord than that they tell the truth. There's a second reason he begins here. Hand in hand with that, we can also say this, there's nothing more characteristic of the old self than lies. Our old life, what characterized our life before we knew Jesus Christ? It was a life of lies. It was a life of deceit. Not only did we tell lies, but we lived our life in accordance with a lie. Do you notice the terms that he uses to describe our old life in verses 17 through 24? Look at verse 17. He says, The Gentiles, the other Gentiles, those who don't know Christ, they walk in the futility of their mind. There's an emptiness in their soul. They live their life in pursuit of empty things. They keep coming up empty. Why? Because they're chasing lies. The lies of Satan, the lies of the world system. 
the lies of the flesh and of sin. These things will satisfy. These things will make you happy. These things will give you joy. And we pursue those things in, in our lostness before we knew Christ and we found them all to be lies. It left us empty. And in verse 18 he says, we were darkened in our understanding. There were things we didn't grasp, couldn't see, didn't understand in sin. We were living in darkness, in blindness. Didn't recognize the truth. The things that sounded good to us were lies. In fact, in verse 18, he uses another word. He says there was an ignorance in us because of the ignorance that is in them. We didn't know the truth. In verse 22, he says that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance, notice this, with the lust of deceit, of deceit. Our life was a life of desire, a life of chasing after things, but the things that drove our lives were desires that were deceitful. Never gave us what they promised. Our entire life before we knew Christ was the life lived in accordance with the lie of Satan. Why would we want to lie anymore? We had enough of lies, didn't we? We've come to know the truth. Now we want to not only live in the truth, we want to speak the truth. There's a third reason why he begins here. And that is, there's nothing more characteristic of our old master than lies. Not only was our old life a life of lies, but we were that way because that was the way of our Father. If you don't know God as your Father through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have not experienced the new birth, if you have never been saved, who is your Father? Satan is. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 44, You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies, you see. And he was your father. He was your master. Do we realize this morning that the present condition of this world all started with the lie? Satan not only lied to Eve and to Adam about what God actually said and twisted the words of God, but beyond that, he lied about God's motive in the whole thing. And so it all started with the lie. In the present condition of this world, all of the sin, all of the misery, all of the death, all of the murder, all of the heartache, it all started with the lie. We have been made new creations. We've been brought into a new kingdom. We have a new master. We have a new father. Why would we ever want to live in accordance with our old master's ways? He's a liar. Look at Acts chapter 13 with me, if you would. Acts chapter 13 and look at verse 6. Acts 13, verse 6, And when they had gone through the whole island, as far as Paphos, they found a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was the proconsul, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas the magician, for thus his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith, but, Paul, but Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze upon him and said, You, who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Would you agree with me that the Apostle Paul spoke straightforwardly about false teaching? I would think so. And here's a man who is full of deceit. He's full of fraud. And what is at the root of it all? You are a son of the devil. That's what's at the root of it all. God's people simply are not characterized by lying. But those who belong to Satan are characterized by lying because that is their father's nature. However, we do need to say this. God doesn't warn Christian people about things that Christian people can't fall prey to. 
And if he's saying to Christian people, and he is in Ephesians 4.25, to put away lying and to speak the truth, each one of us with our neighbor, for we are members of one another, what does that tell you? It is possible for Christians to fall prey to the sin of lying. And Satan, in fact, is at work in that. He, he definitely wants to trap Christians into a life of telling lies. Now, that will not be our life pattern. As I said earlier, if you're truly born again, your life pattern will be one of righteousness. Someone who habitually tells lies is someone who does not know Christ. But it is possible for a believer to fall prey to the sin of lying. We see an example of it in Acts chapter 5, if you'll look over there. The context, the setting is the church. Acts chapter 5, look at verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. They sell a piece of property. They bring a portion of the sale. They lay it down as an offering as if they were offering the whole of it. It was an outright lie. Verse 3, But Peter said, Ananias, now notice, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? So you see, satanic activity involved in this lie. Yet notice he was completely responsible. Verse 4, While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? At the same time, Satan is influencing, yet Ananias conceived the deed in his own heart. He says, you have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. At the very inception of the church's life, our God makes clear to us that lying is a serious sin. Totally unbecoming of the believer, totally unbecoming of the Christian, will not be tolerated. So why does the Apostle... Look back in Ephesians 4.25. Why does he start at the point that he begins at telling us to speak the truth? Well, first of all, there's nothing more characteristic of our new nature than to tell the truth. Nothing more characteristic of our old life than telling lies. Nothing more characteristic of our old master than to tell lies, for he is the father of all lies. There's another reason, though. There's nothing more characteristic of our new master than the truth. You say that you've been saved. You say that you've come to know the Lord. That means you have a new master, right? That means that you have fellowship with the living God. He is not only your master, He is your Father. Your new nature has been made in the likeness of Him. You have been, you've been made a partaker, in fact, of the divine nature so that, so that the very nature of God is expressed in your new nature. Now, I wonder, what characterizes your Father? You say you know Him. You say that His nature has been given to you in your new nature. What characterizes Him? Hebrews 6.18 says this, in order that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we may have strong encouragement. He says it is impossible for God to lie. Titus 1.2 says, In the hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. It is impossible for God to lie. God cannot lie. He is the God who is absolutely truthful. No lie found in Him. So that if you really have fellowship with Him, and if your new nature is really there, if you've really been made a new creation in Christ, you will not be characterized by lying. You cannot be characterized by lying. You will be characterized by telling the truth, for that is the very nature of your Father. It's His nature. It's interesting, in Revelation, the book of Revelation, as we've been studying, you have the 144,000 Jewish witnesses. They receive the, the seal of God on their foreheads. You see them in Revelation 14, toward the end of the tribulation period, standing with the Lamb of God. And do you remember how they are described? 
What characterized those 144,000 witnesses? Revelation 14.5 says this, And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. They weren't sinless. But because they had been made new by the Lamb of God, they were characterized by truthfulness. And no lie was found in their mouth. Nothing more characteristic of your new master than the truth. There's a fifth reason why he would begin with this. There's nothing that reveals our sinfulness more than lies. What are we to do in this new life? We're to put away sin. We're to walk in righteousness. Now, if I want to start to, to, to deal with a sin that sort of wraps all other sin into it, Here's a great one to begin with because there's nothing more characteristic of what sin really is than telling lies. Have you ever thought about all the different ways that people can lie? He tells us in verse 25, lay aside falsehood. That is, in, in, in every form, all lying, all falsehood must be put aside. There's no way we can exhaust it this morning, but let me give you a few ways that people lie. Sometimes people lie with outright false speech. I mean, they just say things that aren't true. And that happens, I think, more than we want to believe. People just say things that just are not true. And they know it to be untrue. Another way that people lie is by giving false impressions. You know, you can lie without saying a word. You can lie with a look. You can lie with silence. Has it ever happened to you that someone has come up to you and they're angry, they're upset about something and they're upset about what someone said or what someone believes and you know in your heart that you believe exactly like the person they're mad at. But they tell you and you don't say a word. Why? Because you don't want them mad at you. What have you done? You've lied. You give them the impression that you're with them when the truth is you're not. We lie with exaggeration. You embellish the facts. You play it up bigger than it is. You add a few details that never happened. What is that? That's a lie. That's a lie. We lie by covering up. That's the, that's the sad thing about lying. If you tell a lie, you usually have to tell another to cover the first one. And then you have to tell another to cover the second that you told to cover the first. I think this is one of the things that broke David's heart perhaps as much as anything else when he thought about his sin with Bathsheba. He knew that he had been deceitful. In Psalm 51, a psalm of confession, he says, Behold, Thou dost desire truth in the innermost being. There he is confessing his sin to God. Lord, I know you're the God who desires truth in my inner man, yet I've been deceptive. And people, what you cover up about doesn't have to be some grand thing in order for it to be wrong. What do you teach your children when the phone rings and you say to them, tell them what? I'm not here. <laughs> Where are you <laughs> if you're not here? And you can try to uh, rename your bedroom Dallas and tell them I'm in Dallas, but that still won't make it right. Covering up is sin. Pretense. There you are in a group and you want to feel like you belong. You want, to, you want to feel like you're in their circle. And so what do you do? You act like someone who is not you. You put on airs. You put on a face. You put on an appearance. You try to fit in. You try to play the part. What is that? That's a lie. Every time we try to justify our sin, we're lying. Every time you know that you've done wrong... And you're offering excuses and reasons and justifications for why you did what you did. That's just not owning up to the truth, is it? It's a form of lying. And what's worse is when we're trying to justify our sin, 
using Scripture. Using the Holy Word of God that is a word of truth and twisting it and turning it so as to explain why we've done what God disapproves of. It's lying. Flattery is a form of lying. You say nice things to people to their face because you want to win their favor, because you want them to like you, because you want to feel good. Flattery is a form of lying. Broken vows. If you want to know whether or not we live in a world full of lies, just look at how vows are broken. Broken vows. The Scripture says, A righteous man swears to his own hurt and does not change. Psalm 15 or 19. I don't remember. I think 15. A righteous man swears to his own hurt and does not change. I try to tell people before they get married, I want you to listen to what you're about to say. Because what do we vow when we get married? Until death parts us. Is it the truth? Let me also add this though. To tell the truth, to be a truth teller doesn't mean you tell everything that's on your mind. That can also be a form of lying. Brother, I just want to ask you to forgive me for how I've been feeling towards you. Well, you don't really want forgiveness. You just want that brother to know how you've been feeling about him. And so in the name of telling them the truth, you're lying. There's nothing more revealing about our sinfulness than lying. And what is at the root of all these forms of lying? At the root of it all, and this is the essence of sin, at the root of it all is self. People don't lie for God. They lie for self. Self-promotion, self-protection, self-gratification, self-gain. It's all about self. It's all about sin. There's a sixth thing. The last thing I'll mention this morning, why he would have started here. There's nothing more destructive to the church than lies. And that's really what he emphasizes here. There's nothing more destructive to the church than lies. He says, verse 25, and notice this, this method that he uses throughout this entire section. He gives us what we're not to do. He gives us what we are to do. And he tells us why. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, that's what you're not to do. Speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. That's what you are to do. Here's the reason. For we are members of one another. And when he uses the term neighbor here in this context, he's talking about another Christian. How do you know that, Richard? Because he says we are members of one another. That cannot be said of a Christian and an unbeliever. So he's saying, make sure in, in the... And he's dealing here with the life of the church. As you deal with one another in the church of Jesus Christ, as you deal with your brothers and sisters, you make sure that you put aside all forms of deceit and lying and you speak truth to one another. Why? Because you are members of one another. It gets to our very understanding of what the church is, who we are in Jesus Christ. How are we to love one another? Let's begin, let's begin with a matter of love. As Christians, how are we to love one another? Matthew twenty two thirty six. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. When I come to know Christ for the first time, I have the capacity to love other people Whereas before, my life was characterized by me loving me. Now I know Christ and I can love you as I love me. As I once loved me. I take love that once was reserved for self and I love you with the love of God. Love one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, let me ask you, how many here this morning want to be lied to? How many here want to be deceived? How many here enjoy it when someone is not transparent with you? Well, then don't do that to your brother. Don't lie to your sister. Don't be deceptive with 
your brethren. Love your neighbor as yourself. How are we related to one another? He says here we're members of one another. We are part of the same body. Christ is the head. We form a spiritual, organic union. We are one body. Do you realize that what you do to another in the body of Christ, you do to yourself? Do you realize you cannot lie to a brother or sister without really lying to yourself? You can't deceive them without deceiving you. You can't hurt them without hurting you. If I ask you this morning, may I chop off your finger? You say, well, certainly, it's just my finger. It's not me, right? You say, no way. You hurt my finger, you hurt me. I said this in the first service in Gordon. Harris, who's missing a finger, he said, you're exactly right. I cut my finger off. It wasn't hurting anymore, but I was. I was. When you hurt your brother, you hurt you. When you hurt your sister, you hurt you. Don't lie to one another. We are members of one another. Then we ask, what as the church, what is our task in the world? What is our work? What is our purpose? We read it earlier, 1 Timothy 3.15. But in, in the case I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. In those days, they would build those pagan temples and those columns, those pillars, studded with jewels, and they would beautify those pillars because they spoke of the glory, the supposed glory of their false gods. Well, we are the pillar of the truth of God, church, in the world. We not only stand to uphold the truth of God in the world, God means through our lives to beautify the truth, to, to put on display the beauty of the truth of God in His people. How can we serve the purpose to uphold the truth of God and to beautify the doctrine of God in this world if we are characterized by the very opposite of that which we say we stand for? We say we stand for the truth. How can we then be characterized by lies? When you understand what the church is, you have to tell the truth. We stand for the truth in the world. We're the pillar in support of the truth. This also gets to a very, very important issue, and that is what should the ministry of the Word of God be characterized by? I know we've talked about it a lot, but I, I go on talking about it. I think it's so important given what's going on in our world, given what's going on in churches around us. This whole seeker-sensitive thing. You know the theory, right? We're going we're to present a winsome, attractive front to the world, something they would be interested in. We're going to get them in here, and then eventually we're going to get around to telling them what we really believe. What is that? It's a lie. Do you realize we have a whole movement today, an entire methodology of ministry built on deception? Nothing should be further from the church than this idea of strategizing. What is our strategy? I'll tell you what our strategy is. Tell the truth. That's the strategy. That's the ministry of the Word of God. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, please. And look at verse 1. This is the ministry. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but after we had already suffered and had been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error, or impurity, or by way of deceit. But just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor were the pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority, but we proved to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having thus a fond affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. There's the ministry. 
you really love people, you really care about their souls, you really love them with the love of God. And so, with absolute transparency and straightforwardness, with conviction that comes from believing the truth, you speak the truth to them. Not in an erroneous way, not with impure motives, not twisting the Word of God or adulterating the Word of God, not by flattering them, but you speak the truth in love. That's the ministry. We're living in a time when the church actually thinks it's spiritual to flatter the world. To flatter the world. To tell them something other than the truth. Which is they are standing in a lost condition before an almighty holy God. They deserve His wrath. And if they don't repent and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will perish. That's the truth. That's the truth. Their greatest need is not seven ways to a hot marriage. Five ways to better organize their lives. Three ways to be a better leader. No, their need is for Jesus Christ. That's their need. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you look there, you see another picture of this approach to the ministry that should characterize believers. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, look at verse 1. Therefore, since we have received this ministry, as we received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame. Not walking in craftiness, Oh, that the church today would hear that. Not walking in craftiness, not relying on our strategies and our crafty plans or adulterating the Word of God. And by the way, when you only preach certain parts of the Word of God and you ignore others and you do it purposely because you think it's going to offend a lost and dying world, you have adulterated the Word of God. You have adulterated it. But by the manifestation of truth, by the unveiling of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And you unveil the truth in this way because you understand something. Verse 3, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. We preach the truth knowing that some will not receive it. Their minds are, are blinded by the God of this world. But in the case of others, the same God who said, Let there be light will speak light into their heart, shine His light into their inner man, and for the first time they'll see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, and they'll be saved. There's our confidence. Verse 7, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. But having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke, we also believe, therefore also we speak. You see, there's the ministry. Not strategizing, crafty plans. How can we do this? No, you believe, therefore you speak. And you speak knowing that only God can change hearts anyway. You believe, therefore you speak. A transparent, straightforward, honest, truthful approach to reaching a lost and dying world. Why does he say, here's the new life, tell the truth? Why does he start there? Because there's nothing more characteristic of a new creature than that they put away lies and they tell the truth. Nothing more characteristic of an unconverted person than that they tell lies and their life is lived on the basis of the lie. 
Nothing more characteristic of our old master, Satan, than that he's a liar and the father of lies. Nothing more characteristic of a new master, our Father in heaven, who cannot lie, for whom it is impossible, it's impossible for him to lie. Why does he begin here? Because this, this is how you put away sin. Nothing more characteristic of sin than lying. All kinds of sins wrapped up in it. Nothing more destructive to the church than to tell lies. Nothing more characteristic of an of a biblical ministry than that you tell the truth. You tell it in love. You tell it with full dependence upon the Lord. But you tell the truth. Transparently loving people. Transparently reaching people with the good news of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads together, please. Let me ask you this morning, my friends, do you know the One who is the truth? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by Him. Do you know the One who is the truth? Are you a new creature? Are you a new creation? Did you lay aside the old self and put on the new self by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ? Or is it that this morning there's someone here that you know your life is characterized by lies? If we say we know Him who is the truth, then let us demonstrate it by putting away all falsehood. Where have you been telling lies? Perhaps you've been justifying your sin. Perhaps you've been trying to fit into a crowd that is not yours. Perhaps you've been exaggerating. Perhaps you've been flattering. Perhaps you've been lying in some other way. Would you put it all away? And remember, if you're born again, remember who you are. Remember who your Father is. Remember what He's done in you. Father in heaven, thank you for the truth. Thank you that you've placed the truth in us who know you. Thank you, dear Father in heaven, that all lies are forgiven only in the Lord Jesus Christ, but that his precious and shed blood did indeed wash away even this sin of lying. And that in those whom You save, You put a desire to live in truth, to walk in truth, and to speak the truth. We give You praise. Lord, for the one here this morning who doesn't know You, may they even this very day, this very moment, call out to the One who is the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting Him on the basis of His death, for sins and sinners on the basis of His resurrection and the fact that He sat down at Your right hand, Dear Father, and has finished everything necessary for redemption, may they look to the Lord Jesus Christ asking Him, asking You, dear God, for salvation. We ask You this in Jesus' name.